and um, I would like to welcome everyone and especially those that are joining us for the first time today. Um, I'm just going to ask us to just take a few moments of silence uh, for all, all those who passed away due to COVID and um, especially those who have lost loved ones and friends because of COVID. Uh, we've lost um, one of our members, Surin, who also passed away. So just to take a few moments. Thank you. Our speaker today is Frances, and uh, we are so delighted that she will share uh, her knowledge about St. Hildegard. And I'm really looking forward to her presentation. Um, the last uh, video that we did about St. Uh, Hildegard, where we listened to Matthew Fox, uh, got over 510 views. So yeah, there's definitely a lot of interest about Hildegard. So I will ask um, Frances to unmute herself and to tell us more about herself and about the research she's done, and then we can start with the presentation. Thank you, Frances. Hello, you're welcome, PJ. Can you hear me? Yes, can I can. I can. Enough? Fine. Uh, Thank you. The audience. So I'm uh, Frances Bonhand. <laughs> I'm a sister of Nazareth, living in Pretoria. I have a background of nursing, actually, um, not academics at all. But anyway, one thing led to another. After I've nursed for a number of years, mostly um, we care for elderly and children in the different national houses, sort of in different countries, but in South Africa, of course. Um, and then, of course, as our life went on, I became, I actually studied theology, so very trepidly, I wasn't, uh, anyway, anyway, my friend, a friend of mine who had just finished her theology, we are living in Pretoria, in the same community, so she was at the National Seminary, so I then, as she was finishing, I started, so anyway, I did an undergraduate there at ETH, and then I knew Cecilia, quite well, very well, because they sort of almost, we live opposite other, almost on the same street, and she's a bit further down. So anyway, she encouraged me to continue. So I did an honors degree in spirituality at UNISA. And then I was also teaching, you know, taking students at John Vianney, which is a seminary, National Center for Spiritual Direction. And then I was asked to teach, to help out with teaching spirituality from 2010 to 2013, and then I had some congregational work to do. They decided, no, you've been playing around enough, you come back in and do something for NAS again. And then, anyway, recently I did a master's. I finished last year at St. Augustine's, also in Christian spirituality. Um, and my, it was a taught master's with modules, as Trish knows, and anybody else, and Jimmy, anybody else. Who, contact with St. Augustine's. So my mini dissertation was, uh, I could, the title, anyway, the theme of it is the writings of St. Hildegard of Bingen and in comparing them with Laudate Si by Pope Francis on the ecological effects of climate change, something on that. That's more or less, that's the theme of it. Okay, I've got the research paper up here if you really want the full title, but that's it. You know? And based on La Dauté C, of course, yeah, because it hadn't been out that long. So that's, and I became interested in Hildegard because she's a, I think you call her a polymorph, and I'm a bit like that. 
I did nursing and I did all ten, like reflexology and later on, you know, I trained in reflexology, aromatherapy, that sort of thing, then theology and then I was a leader for three years, a local leader. Um, I'm a bit controversial, so, but anyway, so, you know, I've and sort of a bit of art and different things. So I, I could identify in some ways with Hildegard, especially like the mandalas and the alternative medicine and that kind of thing. So, where to now? Is that all right, DJ? Yes, thank you. Uh, you're welcome to, to start your presentation. Right. This is the title, Prophetic Woman and Visionary, from the God of Bingham. The sculpture here in front is by Dr. Aneta Esser. And uh, you'll hear more about, uh, about her. Right. So we, I've just had a prayer for, to St. Hildegard, which is written by herself. So um, it's not actually in our, you know, kind of way of English of speaking, but in way we can Sorry, but we can say that if, you'd like, if you can see, we can say it together, or I can read the prayer. So, yeah. Hildegard's prayer to the Holy Spirit. Fire of the Spirit, life of the lives of creatures, spiral of sanctity, bond of all natures, glow of charity, lights of clarity, taste of sweetness to sinners, be with us and hear us. Composer of all things, light of all the risen, key of salvation, released from the dark prison, hope of all unions, scope of chastities, joy in the glory, strong honor, be with us and hear us. Amen. Okay, the next one is a song. So it's kind of a reflective and meditative. Um, just to get us going. So it's called Holy Ignited Spirit, contemporary song inspired by St. Hildegard. So it's not, you know, she wrote music in that, it's not her actual original, but um, you'll see on that when I open up the CD, that it's a sort of a modern interpretation. And that's uh, Susan Lincoln and Craig Tugart. Oh, Thank you. 
lecture our consciousness again. So, who was Hildegard of Bingen? Hildegard was born in 1098 into a noble family of Berhem Inspiron, near the town of Alrezzo, in the province of Rheinhessen in Germania, today's Rhineland in Germany. She was the tenth child of Hildebert von Bermesheim and his wife Mathilde, who belonged to the local nobility with, the, with extended family connections and material wealth. We're just starting with the kind of a background of Hildegard, so we know who she is. Hildegard was entrusted into the care of the noble woman and anchoress, Dutta von Spanheim, in an anchorite hold attached to the Benedictine monastery in Dissi Bodenberg. We're going to hear more about all this in a few couple of videos that we have as well. It is thought that Hildegard was sent to the anchor hold for her safety due to her closeness to God and her gift of healing powers, which were regarded with suspicion and condemned by the 12th century church authorities at the time. Hildegard lived with two or three other children who were trained by her guardian. Dutta in the monastic life that consisted of a daily routine of chanting and praying the Psalms in Latin and engaging in handcrafts. So Hildegard was only about eight years old and she was tied as the tenth child, which was the custom in that time. So she was the last child of ten, ten children. Hildegard learned the scriptures, the rule and spirituality of St. Benedict but received no formal education, as it was customary in medieval Europe that only men and not women would attend the monastic cathedral schools or emerging universities. So um, the quotes here, Crane, all these are sort of, um, you know, Hildegard, like many of the saints, could be made like the kind of their genuine life, or it could be a little bit deviated with the hagiography. Um, but all, because this is sort of from our research paper, these are like genuine facts as they can get, of course. So coming, she wrote her own life called A Beat of Her Vita. So we just start dealing with the reality as best as we can. Which, so from the scholar's point of view. The political and religious landscape of Hildegard of Bingen, of course, all this is very much abbreviated for this purpose. 
In spite of its relatively stable social hierarchical structure, 11th century Germany experienced political and religious uncertainty as a result of conflicts and power struggles between the rulers who were kings and emperors and between church and state. The church was aligned with a feudal system in which the hierarchy received land and titles from political rulers to whom they owed allegiances. Popes and bishops had their own armies of soldiers to defend their titles and property. During this age of the Crusades, Germany was in the midst of ongoing factions between local rulers and the German crown. And then between the crown and the papacy, they were all fighting among themselves, and between European royal families. All of this brought the papacy into disarray. So this is the 11th century. As many as 10 anti-popes and 12 bona fide elected popes were in office during Hildegard's lifetime. And fortunately for her, an exceptional saintly pope who was in office from 1145 to 1153 was the former Cistercian monk, Pope Eugenius III, who approved Hildegard's first major work, Stivias, at the Senate of Tierra. So, I mean, there's a long story around her work and the visions, and, but anyway, miraculously, uh, she, her, her first work, which took her 10 years to write, was kind of approved by the church, if you know. Okay, this is a, a little video um, about her childhood, which the videos are helpful because, um, you know, they're taken on location and it's, it, we, we get in without me kind of reading everything that's available. Join us now on the Hildegard from the town of Herstein to the village of Niederhosenbach. According to recent historical research, Hildegard was born in this remote place, which was dominated by the manor house of her family. Our station is at the Protestant church of Niederhosenbach. The church contains a facsimile edition of the Liber Scivias. We listen to Hildegard speaking about her family and childhood. My father Hildebrecht was the lord of Bermersheim and Niederhosenbach. My noble mother Mechtel came from Merksheim. She gave birth to ten children. You will probably know my brothers Trutwin, who as the oldest is the heir of our manor house, Rorikos, who later became a cantor in Mainz Cathedral, and Hugo, who became a canon in Trollai. You will also have heard of my four sisters, Irmgard, Jutta, Odila, and Clemencia. As the tenth child, my parents dedicated me to God while sighing, just as one gives the tithe of the harvest to the church. Later on, I truly accepted that my parents wished me to live a religious life when at age 16 I took the veil in the monastery of St. Desibord. I will talk more about this later. I grew up well sheltered in the circle of my siblings and I can only say that I had a very good life. Our noble family was related to the Earl of Sponheim and of course we had servants and the farmers from the surrounding land had to deliver goods in kind to our manor house. For everyone, there was always much work to do, but we also celebrated the feasts of the church, Christmas, Easter, Pentecost, St. John's and All Saints. Sometimes my father rode to the seat of the archbishop in Golden Mines. This big city on the river 
had always impressed him again with its massive walls and grand churches. From there, he brought back precious fabrics and spices from faraway countries. And once also a knight's armor, just like the ones that were also sold in London. We also heard much about what was going on in the empire, about the imprisonment of King Henry by his own son in Bethlehem Castle, and about the return of Archbishop Gutard of Mainz after years of exile. As a child, of course, I did not understand much of these political events. I was often ill, and I saw things that others found only peculiar or at best miraculous. In spite of all the love in the circle of my family, I was also often not understood, and I was a lonely soul. From Niederhosenbach, the Hildegard Way leads to forests and lawns to the village of Bergen. There is a guest house and a Hildegard pilgrimage station. The way from Bergen takes its course to Kiln, thereby passing the Brook Valley Trübenbachtal. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed learning about this stage of the Hildegard Way. We hope you continue with us on our pilgrimage walk. Okay, are we all there still? Yes, thank you. Okay, and you can hear me fine? Yes. Okay. So this is just um, a map, of, you know, remote map of uh, the area of, of Hildegard, uh, Dissebodenburg, the Rupertsburg, Evengein, Evengein, I can't say it, pronounce these words, but Evengein is the monastery that's being yeah, here about that. Obviously, all the river Rhine, Bingen is, which is Hildegard from Bingen. So, Mainz is sort of the main, uh, Trish knows she's been there <laughs> to, to this area. And Mainz, Mainz is probably the major town or city, you know, of that. Well, Worms, we know, is connected to Martin Luther, but anyway. So, that's, and the river, these, where the river defines the Nian and the I think it's another small tributary that's not yet. So that also comes into the Naya, comes into Hildegard's life. So that's okay. Then Hildegard's life path. At the age of 15, Hildegard was received into the order and took her vows as a Benedictine nun. By 1113, more young women had joined Duta and Hildegard in the anchor hold which gradually developed into a small convent of women who remained dependent on the Benedictine Dissy Bodenberg Monastery for liturgical and administrative services. Apparently the anchor hold was sort of bricked up like, I don't know, like a cell. And I suppose, I mean, the, the monastery, the male monastery was huge and they were in this small side place. I think they probably had a window for mass, I don't know you know, to, to, to partake in the Mass, not like we do today, of course, but, you know, they were very kind of restricted. 
Hildegard and the Close Benedictine. Hildegard made her vows in 1112, in which were received by Otto, Bishop of Bamberg, who represented Aldebert, the Bishop of Mainz. It was the practice in monasteries to receive and accept children from noble families, aged from five to eight years old, and to allow only women from noble families to enter convents a trend which Hildegard continued in her foundation. There was a little bit of when I was doing the proposal that, you know, um, maybe people who didn't know too much about Hildegard, I and mean, she's come to the fore because she's made a doctor of the church in 2012, so, but she only took people from noble families. How can she relate, you know, our context, and especially in South Africa? But, you know, we got over that one because that was her context, and it's kind of a minor detail compared to how relevant she really is today. Right, so now, since it's St. Patrick's Day, I thought I would elaborate on Disibod, who's a saint from 594 query to 674. So this is like before Hildegard's time, but, you know, plays itself out. So, Disibod was the son of the lesser chieftains in Ireland. So, um, because I have a, I live with a few Irish, some of them are sisters, and one is a priest in our community here. So I thought, well, I can do them credit today. And interestingly, when I found out that Hildegard um, was somehow connected to the Celts, I thought, you know, this didn't come into the research. I do my own bit of research about Disibod. He became a bishop according, according to the biography by the Abbess Hildegardus. Great scandals prevailed all over Ireland at this time. Some people rejected the Old and New Testament and denied Christ. Others embraced heresies. Some relapsed into paganism and others desired to live like beasts and not like humans. Resigning from being a bishop, he collected a few religious men and left Ireland. So he was, had a Benedictine background. After a long, very long journey, he arrived in Alemania, which almost corresponded to the present territory of Baden. In a vision one night, he was told that he should find a suitable place to settle. So he was like... Um, a pilgrim, if you like. Hearing of, of the people dwelling on the left bank of the Rhine, he went in that direction and crossing the river Glan, so that's the other part of the river, it's the river, yeah, the second one that I didn't find there. After 10 years of wandering, he saw a high hill covered in a forest. Disibar decided to settle there with his three, three friends. Anyway, that's the reference where I've got that Wikipedia. After living some time in Germany, Disibard learned the language of the people and was able to speak to his visitors of the word of life and salvation. When his community was finally established, the monks occupied a range of huts in Irish fashion on the brow of the hill, while he lived as a hermit lower down and apart from them. They followed the rule of St. Benedict. Hildegard wrote the Vita Sancta Disibod, Disibod, the life of Saint Disibod in 1170. She also wrote a life, wrote a life of Saint Rupert and a commentary on the Benedictine rule. So Vita means the, the biography, I believe that Latin too. So that is the Disibodenberg, one of the monastic ruins that we see today. Now I have a little video, also part of it, I forgot to say, this pilgrimage videos, is two of them today, that you see, are, I, um, they, had, they had planned a Hildegard pilgrimage in Bingen, in the area, in Germany, for 2020, but of course they couldn't have it. So they decided to um, offer it virtually, so as part of my retreat, Last year, I joined a pilgrimage on, well, it wasn't Zoom, but on, on a network like this. On these videos, we had a different 
every day for, I think it was 12 days, we had like a, a talk from a scholar and then we had these videos. And before the video, we also had um, a prayer service, which I haven't included here because it's too long, by um, Trish, you might know her, Shannon's steering, is it steering bird? I don't know, it's left my mind. Okay, she is uh, a priest in Ohio and she runs the Hildegard House. And she, from her church, or her, yes, it is a church, she um, led the prayer service before the pilgrimage video. So that just gives you that the videos were taken on a previous pilgrimage, and I think it was 2016, by those that ran the pilgrimage and, and the pilgrims, as you see. And Shannon was one of those, I think, with her daughter, one of her daughters. And so then they used those videos as part of the online pilgrimage last year, which I joined. So, okay, so the Hildegard Way, Dissy Bodenberg was, for, oh yes, there it is. So this is about saying Dissy Bodenberg. Join us now for a time at the Dizzy Bodenberg, which is at the center of the Hildegard Way. Hildegard lived here for almost 40 years of her life. We are in the early morning at the old ruin site, just at the time of sunrise. That is, at the time of the Lord's, the monastic morning praise of God. We are standing in the new Hildegard Chapel, where Hildegard speaks about her entrance into the monastery of St. Dizibod. On All Saints' Day 1112, after the incarnation of Christ, I, a virgin of 14 years, entered the monastery of St. Dizibod. This was together with my teacher, Jutta of Sponheim, who by then was already 20 years of age and to whom I had been entrusted six years before. With us was another virgin whose name was Jutta as well. The Benedictine monks, who themselves had only come to the holy mountain of St. Dizibord six years before, under the patronage of Archbishop Ruthard of Mainz, were very pleased about our arrival. For with the foundation of the woman's cell, under Magistra Jutta, their monastery would now become a double convent. More and more of these were founded in the empire at this time. Our new Magistra, Lady Jutta, took the veil from Abbot Burkhardt on the same day. I only took the veil two years later when I was 16. In the almost 40 years that I lived on the Dizzy Bodenberg, where I became the new magistra after Jutta's death in 1136, I have seen and learned a lot. I enjoyed participating in Benedictine life with the liturgy of the hours, the singing of the psalms and high mass on solemnities. I loved the music. I have to say that for the longest time we lived on a building site. Thus, the foundation stone of our huge St. Nicholas Church had already been laid Anno Domini 1108, yet only in 1143 was the church finally consecrated by Bishop Henry of Mainz, who then also dedicated the high altar to St. John. When the bones of St. Ursula and her 11,000 virgins had been found in Cologne in 1120, a part of our relics came to us on the Dizzy Bodenberg. Ursula, who had loved the Son of God in true faith and who had abandoned man and world, was my favorite saint. I have composed a whole cycle of songs 
for her solemnity on October 21. In 1143, we could finally bury the relics of St. Disibod in the church crypt. At the request of Abbot Hellinger and the Disibodenberg monks, I compiled the Vita of this Gaelic-speaking Irish monks 30 years later. He had come to the Franconian Empire in the dark period of the 7th century and he had settled down where his walking stick put into the earth turned green, where a white hint poured a well of fresh water from the earth and where two rivers united. This was exactly here where I have lived for 40 years. We invite you now to spend some time at the Dizzy Bodenberg to sit, meditate, pray and maybe to walk through the labyrinth at the women's cell. Thank you for watching. I'm Dr. Annette Esser and we hope you enjoyed following us on this stage of the Hildegard Way. There is so much more to come as we follow the trail and reflect on Hildegard, her visions and wisdom and the beauty of the places she loved. Please join us and discover the land of Hildegard. Okay. Good, thanks. All right. Oh, sorry, I need to go back on. Now, okay. The, Dr. Shannon Steeringer. Sorry, I couldn't remember the name. So, this is Dr. Shannon I was telling you about, who used to introduce the prayer every day during the pilgrimage. So, this is um, a video. I actually. Um, joined a talk of hers over the weekend, this last weekend. I get the newsletter and then, um, so this, then she um, has this on YouTube and we were to, uh, if you listen to this before the actual, it was a short, what she called a retreat. It was just a couple of hours of that she presented. So here we go. So she tells, also gives a synopsis of Elder Carl. It could be a little repetitive, but it does give you more depth of her life and kind of puts it into a caption. Who was St. Hildegard of Bingen? I'd like to take a moment to read from my 30-day journey with St. Hildegard published by Fortress Press. Hildegard of Bingen was born in 1098 to Hildebert and Mechthild in Niederhosenbach or possibly Bermersheim, Germany. Most of the biographical information on Hildegard is recorded in her Vita, which is a medieval biography, which was composed over several years by at least five scholars, including contributions from Hildegard herself. According to her Vita, at the age of eight years old, Hildegard was tithed as an anchorite, to the male Benedictine monastery at Dissy Bodenberg, under the care of Judah von Spanheim, a rec recluse also born of nobility. Hildegard may not have actually entered the monastery until she, until she took her vows as a young teenager, around the year 1115. From a very young age, Hildegard was gifted with visions, 
She studied the sacred scriptures and theology. She learned to preach and came to master the art of building and administering a monastery, first at Rupertsburg, and then later would expand across the Rhine River into Ibingen. In 1136, Jutta died, and Hildegard was named the new magistra of her community. In 1141, at the age of 43 years old, Hildegard experienced a profound vision of the living light, which commanded her to put into writing the words and images that would be revealed to her. The living light for Hildegard is the divine energy source from which all emerges. Her initial writings were well received by the hierarchy, and in 1148, Pope Eugenius III publicly read excerpts from her work at the Synod of Trier. It was determined that her writings were in fact coming from a divine source, and she was given permission to write down all that the living light had revealed to her. It was from her connection to the living light that Hildegard received her visions and spiritual authority. With the help of Volmar, a Benedictine priest and monk who served as her secretary, confessor, and closest friend for over 60 years, and one of her dearly beloved nuns, Richardus of Stade, she completed her first theological work, Scivias, which was published in 1151. As Hildegard's reputation grew, so did the number of women, wealthy and educated, seeking entry into her religious community. The influx of newly vowed religious created a need for larger quarters. Soon after the synod granted Hildegard permission to write theology, she received a vision instructing her to move her sisters out of Dissy Bodenberg to their own monastery, where they would be free to some extent from the immediate control of the abbot and the male hierarchy. With some difficulty and courageous effort, she sought and received permission from the abbot and the Archbishop of Mainz to move her sisters to their own monastery. The Margravine of Stade, the mother of Richardus, endowed Hildegard's convent with a piece of land. Hildegard began construction immediately, and the convent chapel at Rupertsburg was blessed by Heinrich, Archbishop of Mainz, in 1152. Over the next several years, Hildegard was deeply engaged in writing, composing, healing, preaching, and leading her sisters to grow in light and love by embracing the Benedictine rule. She completed her second theological work, The Book of Rewards of Life, in the early 1160s, and her third theological work, The Book of Divine Works, in the years to follow. During this time, Hildegard suffered from illness and often found herself bedridden for months at a time, though this did not hinder her ministry. In 1158, she received permission to go on a series of four preaching tours. Her homilies were collected and preserved. In 1165, Hildegard founded a second monastery at Ibingen, across the Rhine River from Rupertsburg. While the monastery building itself no longer exists, today a parish church stands on the property housing Hildegard's reliquary, which is believed to include her heart and her tongue. The new cloistered Benedictine Abbey of St. Hildegard was built in 1904 at the top of a hill in Ibingen, overlooking the parish church. Hildegard wrote two works on the natural world and herbal healing, Physica and Causes and Cures. She composed over 70 liturgical hymns, wrote the first known morality play, Ordo Virtutum, wrote several minor works and two hagiographies, contributed to her own vita, created her own language, and produced visual pieces of art, referred to as miniatures, to accompany several of her visions. Throughout her life, Hildegard corresponded with many high-ranking men and women, civil and religious, including kings and popes. Her collection of letters uniquely capture her spirit. Outside of Germany, Hildegard has been virtually unknown for almost 800 years. 
her works were rediscovered in the mid-20th century, it has taken scholars decades to digest and translate this great summa that has been preserved. The depth of her work is still being explored and studied by scholars, theologians, artists, musicians, feminists, and ecologists. In 2012, Pope Benedict XVI canonized Hildegard of Bingen, a saint, and named her the fourth female doctor of the church. Hildegard offers women and men today an example of extraordinary leadership. She was a woman who embraced her time and yet can properly be called a woman ahead of her time. Her ecological message, which reflects a deep respect for the sanctity of the environment and the interconnectedness of all of creation, has much to teach us regarding her divinely ordered place, our divinely ordered place within the cosmos. Hildegard's theological concept of veriditas, or greening power, which she believed was the life force that animates the entire created world, has the power to heal the mind, body, and spirit. Hildegard stood strong in the midst of raging storms, and she never wavered in speaking with the voice of a prophet what she believed was truth. She led with confidence and integrity. St. Hildegard of Bingen knew who she was and what she was being called to do. Nothing prevented her from following the voice of the living light. Her works give us a unique glimpse into her personality and complex thought. So it sort of ends a bit abruptly then. That, as you saw, that last building is Hildegard House today. In, uh, strangely enough, I have a cousin who lives in Cleveland, Ohio, which is not too, too far from Shannon's place. Um, so uh, we've just got kind of this is the end of the presentation. Um, if you like, we can watch this little video, which is it's kind of a contemporary one of somebody just from a geographical point of view and a tourist point of view kind of um, visits um, Bingen and it gives a slightly and you see the monastery closer up and one of the sisters speaks sort of so, um, at the end of it. Hello, this is the Holy Rover in Bingen, Germany, exploring sites connected to Hildegard of Bingen. Hildegard of Bingen was a 12th century mystic, writer, healer, composer, naturalist, and advisor to kings and bishops. I was fortunate to get the chance to explore the sites connected to her life in Bingen, Germany. I began by traveling south by boat through one of the most beautiful sections of the Rhine. The river is bordered by high bluffs and steeply terraced vineyards with picturesque castles every few miles. While much has changed in the nine centuries since Hildegard's time, I realized she too must have been awed by this dramatic landscape. In the town of Bingen, I started my Hildegard tour at the Museum am Strom. I explored its historical exhibits and marveled at displays of her brilliantly colored, highly symbolic visions. Afterwards, I wandered through its garden, planted with some of the medicinal plants mentioned in her writings. Up the hill from the museum, I toured St. Rocha's Chapel, another landmark on the Hildegard Trail. For many centuries, it was the primary place where Hildegard was honored. And in the underground stone vaults where Hildegard's Abbey once stood, I attended a presentation by the Sibius Institute for Art and Spirituality, which is inspired by her teachings. Next, I enjoyed lunch at the Hildegard Forum, a restaurant that follows her teachings on a healthy diet. And then I headed across the river to the town of Rudesheim. At St. Hildegard Abbey, high atop a hill, I learned about her living spiritual legacy. The abbey is incredibly beautiful, built in neo-Romanesque style and surrounded by vineyards. It's home to a community of nuns who honor Hildegard's memory 
while keeping the rhythms of Benedictine life and prayer. Well, it all started in the late 70s when Hildegard was so-called rediscovered. In, the, in former times, nobody read about her or talked about her too much. But then all of a sudden, there came like a big wave in interest in her scriptures and in her person. And the visitors were coming and coming, and especially from foreign countries, from the United States, as I said before. And it was a boom, you know, that came over us. We didn't expect it, and we, and we had no idea why it suddenly all came up again. But since then, Hildegard has been spread in the whole world, and people are coming here, and they sometimes are better informed than we are ourselves. <laughs> Finally, I ended my Hildegard tour at the Parish and Pilgrim Church of St. Hildegard, which is located on the site of Hildegard's second abbey. Its altar features a lovely mosaic of Hildegard's vision of the Holy Trinity. Below is a golden box containing her relics, the final resting place for this remarkable saint, mystic, writer, composer, and healer. So this is also one of Hildegard's prayers. O glorious Saint Hildegard, abbess of the Order of Saint Benedict and doctor of the Universal Church, we now join in prayer the prayer you taught us. God is the foundation of everything. This God undertakes, God gives, such that nothing that is, unnecess that is necessary for life is lacking. Now humankind needs a body that at all times honors and praises. This body is supported in every way through the earth. Thus the earth glorifies the power of God. Amen. So that is all I have. Okay. Then that is, um, as Shannon's video explained, the voice of the living light. And the picture of Hildegard with something on her head is the Holy Spirit. And Balma is Hildegard, she says herself in another part. Uh, which we happen to include here, is that she herself was not formally educated, although her reading and, and so she depended on Vilma to her priest to do the writing for her. And he wrote on a wax tablet. So he was her scribe for her about her visions and her writings. And then one of her friends, which would be another talk, I am the feather on a breath of God. And the other picture is a book by Barbara Newman, who is also a US scholar um, on Hildegard. And she writes this book, Voice of the Living Light. So that here ends my presentation. Thank you. I just wanted to ask you, Francis, uh, you said you missed the pilgrimage because of COVID. Have you ever been uh, to Germany well, I, and Berlin? No, I wasn't going to actually, I hadn't. Because that pilgrimage was 2016, I think that's maybe the last one they had at that time. And oh. I was going to do like my own visit. Oh, okay. And you didn't get around to it? No, I didn't get to go. Oh, shame. And, oh, okay. and I was going to go to Germany from England. That was kind of my remote plan. Oh, well, when you do go, you'll let the community know, will you? <laughs> when you start your planning in case we can come with you. <laughs> oh, shame. Yes, I don't know. But, yeah. Well, see, who knows when they'll be able to have another one, yeah. yeah. And now uh, I was just going to do my own visit. I had written to the Abbey, but mm -hmm. there you must sort of do a retreat or have spirit, you know, you go through the job. So then, uh, then I contacted the Forum, which is where they have the herbs in the garden. You saw the picture there. Mm -hmm. The lady said she had lunch there. Um, well, you that has accommodation. And I was, they had already responded, you know, once. Yeah, well, we can, you can lead a pilgrimage from here. <laughs> uh, Hildegard's quite a complex lady, and my supervisor, we were a bit, you know, her writings are difficult, but fortunately it wasn't a full research paper. If I had to do a doctorate, it would be quite another thing. And of course the focus, the research area is really climate change, the ecological problem of, in the world now, and then by comparing Plant Laudato C with Hildegard's writing. So, I mean, I didn't have to do an extensive research into her writings, but 
you know, they're quite complex. And then she covers various areas, you know, about leadership, not just about um, ecology. So, I mean, I could have written on her as a, from a woman, you know, uh, theology of women or women leadership today in the church which, or deaconesses or anything, but it was all of it. So, so I uh, thank you. We chose the college instead. <laughs> yes. Sorry, I don't know if I made the presentation very relevant, but. <laughs> Sorry, Bridget was um, Francis, can you tell us more about the music that she that she um, wrote? Uh, yes, I was uh, sort of starting to develop something on her music, and they're also quite interesting. Well, she wrote the music for her own sisters, for her own monastery. She was the magistral, which means the leader, the local leader, the abbess. The, the magistral was the main name. Um, so she wrote for, for the prayers of the sisters. Obviously, they're enclosed Benedictines. And um, so they were for, for the chance for the divine office. Um, now, who is somebody? I think it's Barbara Newman also. I'm not sure. No, no. Somebody writes, one of the scholars writes about her music in Symphonia. I'm not sure if that's Barbara Newman. Um, and kind of explains, you know, comments on, on her musical pieces. And there are CDs, and there's quite a lot of stuff on YouTube, short little videos, also about your music. Um, there's a particular way of, of chanting. It's, it's not quite everybody's cup of tea. It depends if you, if you like that. It's not a Gregorian chant, but something in that line. Um, I don't know what else to say. Okay, some of... The, the translations of her music, like she talks about the green finger of God. Now, I'm not sure if that was a poem or a homily. She, of course, obviously she preached and she wrote homilies on the Gospels. Um, and another one is called, some of her poems or songs are ecological, you know, the green finger of God, um, about Mary as the fresh branch of the tree, something like that. I mean, it's, they're beautiful, really. Um, I think I quoted one in my research paper, which I have here, yeah, I don't know, <laughs> you can have a look. Um, so her music is quite diverse, yeah. And, uh, and then another scholar, Kingsley, Kingsley Beverly, wrote, has written two volumes on her gospel homilies, and they're quite fascinating. So on the pilgrimage last year, Every day they would have like Hildegard's art, then they would have a scholar a, you know, talk, give a lecture on it. And then another time, yes, Beverly Kingsley gave a couple of talks. And so they would take out different themes of, of Hildegard's kind of her, her, what she did, you know, Hildegard and woman or her leadership or her art or music, whatever. I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> Sorry, I haven't gone into your music at grand depth. No. But, um, um, yes. Then the second talk, um, I have got a, I don't know how the time is. I have got something. There's uh, another scholar also actually studied Hildegard's music and she found it in X. She, I think she's an actress as well as a theologian, whatever. And she actually in acts dresses up like Hildegard and plays some of the instruments that she used in the monastery. And of course, towards the end of Hildegard's life, uh, there was an interdict against her. They were forbidden, and apparently this really not. I mean, Hildegard was come near eighty at that time. Um, they, they forbade them from receiving communion, which is Holy Communion, which only wasn't every day like we have, and from chanting the divine office. They probably could say it, but they weren't allowed to sing. And, um, and that was because she had buried a crusader, a soldier, in her grounds, and the church in those days said, no, the ground sacred, and he... Um, he was sort of a heretic or whatever it was. He wasn't, uh, 
in with the church of Catholic, but you know, that's respect. But um, she refused and she looked after him. She ran the kind of a little hospice because she used to minister to women with her herbs and her medicines and her plants and whatever. And he was brought in. And she had a resident priest. Um, I don't know if that must have been Bulma. She had a, a resident priest and he kind of gave the sacraments to the sick and that it, you know, as she asked him. And so this young man was brought in and oh, he's a heretic. And there was another, at, at the abbot of the monastery was fighting with Bulma and saying, he shouldn't be here and fighting with him to go, no, this man is a heretic. And then she says that he has, you know, he's made his peace and he's, whatever wrong he did, his Bulma has kind of absolved him and he's, you know, he said, that's with God. And, and um, anyway, she buried him on with the sisters in their plot. And, and of course, she was told to exhume the body. And she says, we are not. And the legend is she covered all the graves with her, the leaves and used her walking stick. I suppose she, you know, she wasn't, she was a bit frail then maybe. And so that they wouldn't know which was, was this young man. I don't think he's got a name. Um, so that was when her music was silenced. And then anyway, um, shortly before she died, everything was like reinstated. You know, they just had to recant and stop their nonsense. <laughs> so that, that was all I know about the music at this stage. No, but there's a lot has been, and you know, musicians, there's a lot of papers have been written. People have written their theses on, on, um, on music, you know, focusing on their music. Uh, I would say I have to do a lot more research to really, um, you know. Mm -hmm. Mark is not here. Fascinating. I'm learning so much about her. <laughs> yeah. Look, I wasn't sure what sort of time frame you were looking at. Anyone else who would like to contribute? Well, thank you very much, Francis, for this interesting presentation. Since you've been working on Hildegard and the ecology, could you tell us a bit more about that. I mean, there was a, it was a very different time, of course, as you've indicated, and so I think it was a very different kind of consciousness um, with regard to the ecology, very different from today. Probably there wasn't the same realization that if we behave irresponsibly, uh, we actually run the risk of destroying our own environment and at some point becoming the victims of that ourselves. So could you tell us a bit more about her outlook? Because she lived in the Rhine and the very <clears throat> lush area, as you saw, she was so in touch with nature herself. And of course, it was a self-sustaining, large, as you saw by the buildings, Benedictine monastery. So, she, you know, they did all their own kind of planting their vegetables for their food. And then she um, had this gift of these medicinal, fruit, uh, medicinal herbs. As Shannon, um, in her little presentation, said that Hildegard wrote uh, well, one book called Causes and Cures. So, um, and she ministered a lot to women, and women who were in their fertile years. And so there were young women with, um, you know, Kind of gynecological problems or just teenage development things, menstruation and all that. And she had the remedies for all that. And she, she counseled these women and gave them herbs and that to help them. And then those that maybe had uh, gynecological problems or fertility problems or pregnancy problems, she, she was able to do that. I mean, she was a, a head of her town, if you know. So that was part of her, and then of course looking after her sisters as well, you know, uh, the causes and cures, the, the ailments, or I mean, there wasn't the modern doctors in that world today. So this was all her 
her development of her ecological kind of consciousness and spirituality and theology, because she was living it, and she was living amongst it in the mind. Okay. Um, and then, and you see, she had these visions, and of course, I mean, the Holy Spirit of God was speaking through her, also helped her in the consciousness of, of what was happening in the world at her time. Imagine 10, <laughs> 10 illegal popes or whatever it was. I mean, it was a time of turbulence in that. Okay, so from an ecological perspective, um, um, so anyway, she had this, she developed in one of her writings, she developed this concept of veriditas or greenness. And um, okay, Jean, Sister Jean Evans wrote an article with somebody out no, on Hildegard's veriditas in um, spirituality, which is, it was a Dominican publication. And she, um, and then a scholar, David Drosky, I asked him for his research paper and he called her um, the, uh, the Green Ecological Campaign or something. So there's not a whole lot of modern scholarship on, um, I mean, there are some, but I think it could still be developed. You know, there's a lot written on the climate and ecology for today and the classes, but not too many have actually explored Hildegard's concepts or her writing or her, her, um, her concept of hereditas. But um, Badowski, uh, he did, and he, um, and he also kind of lamented, and this is going a bit off the track, that Laudate C si didn't really bring in Hildegard a woman, in fact, into this encyclical on the ecological crisis. So I'm just trying to find something that's often... Uh, okay, you can see. Now she had connections with Bernard Clairvoy and she... Clairvaux, and she used to consult him. Okay. Uh, she, she wrote a letter to... This is just kind of giving you an example. This letter to Bernard of Clairvoy about her experience as a Sindhagan is replete with creation images consisting, con consistent with her theology of hereditas. And this is about one of her visions. So she says to him, through this vision which touches my heart and soul like a burning flame, teaches me profundities of meaning. You know, this is his medieval language. Hildegard also praised Bernard's spiritual giftedness and consistency. You are not incons inconstant. You are always lifting up the tree, a victor in your spirit, lifting not only yourself, but also the whole world unto salvation. You are indeed the eagle, gazing directly at the sun. Hildegard pleads, pleads for Bernard's spiritual support and reassurance for the public ministry and ends her letter with references to God and the Blessed Virgin Mary from her, from her theology of creation. So she developed her own theology, well, not, with, through the whole, not just her, as a human, you know, inspiration of her own theology of creation. And so, and so I beseech your aid through the serenity of the Father and through his wondrous word and through the sweet moisture of compunction the spirit of truth. And, and she was great on scripture as well. Bernard McGinn calls her a visionary prophet. He liked her to St. Paul, and um, he kind of gives quite a long lecture, which I actually found on YouTube at one of the universities. I think I forget now the name of the lecture series. But he he kind of describes him to God and kind of so he called her a scripture, a scripture. Uh, so people have different takes on the God. So, but you see, she also, so there it's John 14, 17, but she kind of uses scripture, as you say, in referring to creation, she uses these images. And through the holy sound, which all creation becomes, and through that same word, which gave birth to the world, and through the sublimity of the Father, 
who sent the word with sweet fruitfulness into the womb of the virgin, from which he cut, from which he soaked up flesh, just as honey is surrounded by the honeycomb. Mm. Okay, and then we go on to him again, but he is he's not, he wasn't sort of giving a lecture on eco theology at that point. And then it's about our health problems. And then, of course, she's compared to um, her, to the apocalyptic revelations of John the Evangelist. Okay. And she's described as a triple systematic exegete of the Middle Ages. She's got so many kind of descriptions. Mm -hmm. um, now, there was some on her kind of creation, Benedictine child. So it's against the background of Hildegard's historic content earlier that her visionary spirit with the earth shaped the development of her ec ecological theology and spirituality, which we spoke about. Okay. Um, okay, it was Hildegard's practice of Lexia Divina and, and daily chanting of the Psalms during community liturgical prayer that influenced the development of her Weltbild or vision of the cosmos, characterized in one word, veriditas. That's a Latin word in her lingo. That's her makeup, that's Hildegard's word, is veriditas, meaning greenness. Everything is green. God is green. The finger of God is green. Okay. okay it says here, veriditas, a Latin word for greenness, is derived from the word uvia, which means to become or be green. Well, we, we heard in the video that um, saying Dizzy Bod put his stick in the river and it turned green. So <laughs> we're on the good wicket today, we're in the green zone. Okay, now another very good scholar, Benedictine sister, which I used in this paper. I found the Benedictine Review, some sort of archival copies. Miriam Smith explains the word green in the scriptures. She's written quite a, a few articles on Veriditas. It's used principally as an adjective that describes a vegetation, such as green pastures, but seldom as a noun. Some form of the word Veriditas or greenness, according to Smith, occurs approximately 70 times in the Hebrew scriptures and five times in the New Testament. Hildegard views the word Veriditas in her theology in a much broader and nuanced content. In a vision, you see, she had these visions. So God was speaking to Hildegard. So yeah, well, I haven't gone into the visions. Matthew Fox has quite a nice book. It's, I did show a few of them at the first talk. So it was through Hildegard's visions that she was able to interpret her and develop her theology of Veriditas and her concept. I mean, she's you don't get become a doctor of the church for nothing, I don't think. So, you know, I suppose because her her sisters as have preserved her writings and her artwork. In her visions of the cosmos, Hildegard applied key words on three levels to highlight her concepts, a practice which she developed as a result of a Benedictine spiritual and contemplative formation. Hildegard's, I have to explain this, Hildegard's first level words describe God in terms of icons, the plant of life, looks for rebellions. So she, you know, she, everything was sort of in Latin. And people had to translate her works, of course, from Latin. Word of God, sapienza, and cornerstone, caritas. Her second level word consists of abstract concepts such as wholeness, integrity, real, love, dawn, virtues, and rebellion. Her drawings are in mandalas. That's, you see, and also you can relate that to leadership, can relate that to to wholeness. Um, so we can relate that to wholeness. It's not the pyramid, it's the circle, it's the central. I mean, her mandalas are fascinating. Okay. The term veriditas greenness or life green energy is one of the third levels that deal with the concrete. Hildegard's polyvalent symbol. Veriditas is woven into her writings that include theology, cosmology, anthropology, holistic health, and surgical humanology. That's the music that we asked about. And letters. She wrote, her letters are also have been 
worked and now published in modern words. In the light of this introduction, and we can, can and that's just kind of some, um, and that's the connection that's, that's um, you know, you have to bring, you can't, in the studies nowadays, as you all know, you can't just talk about the past, you have to bring it in today's context. So it is linking um, a modern writing, the encyclical with Hildegard, and to bring it into some kind of what we need today. Okay, so this is, it goes backwards and forwards between Hildegard and Okay. Okay, I'll close. This is where David Dos Dosky is, um, in Toronto, Canada, who's like a modern contemporary scholar, if you like. And he, he talks about the, the absence of women in the encyclical. I mean, that's not our theme, that's another one. Okay. Mm. Sorry, am I boring you all? <laughs> how are we doing? Uh, how are we doing, um, EJ? Yeah, we still have a um, couple of minutes left. Any, are there any more questions? I don't know if I've answered the question. Oh. No. Thank you. So, Francis. Oh, yeah. Yes, I don't know. Yeah, I've lost myself here. Okay, yes. Was a lot today. Uh, what message do you think she would have for the church today? Oh, well, because there's a lot of messages. Um, what would she have for the oh, she, uh, oh. you know, she it, well, gender equality is one. I mean, she was, um, how shall I say, a feminist. I don't know if she's a true feminist, but. You know, there are papers, you know, the feminist dimension of Hildegard, and there are arguments. Was she a feminist or not really? Because of in her time, I mean, women, she does talk about, apparently she was quite, the studies said she was quite very submissive and subservient because she felt inadequate, mainly because she hadn't, um, Bernard again talks about this, was another little book of him and now he is, also McGinn, I don't know, it's, anyway, I'm not sure, McGinn and McGinn, I can send a bibliography or whatever, I can reset a research paper and the, and the bibliography is there. Um, that she went to, she had monastic training, but not formal, and the universities were opening up at that time. But she, because being a woman, she wasn't allowed to go, even though she had the intellect and the ability. All right, she didn't have any formal schooling like we have today, but due to in this anchorage, she was trained, you could say she lived theology, you know, with the Alexio Divina, the Benedictine way of life. Um, so she had what you call informal or if you like monastic training. I mean, there were monastic schools, but she had no, nothing was formalized. She couldn't say I'm qualified for this or that or the other. So she, she wouldn't discuss, she was sick a lot because she wouldn't um, talk about her visions. She wouldn't talk about what the Lord was saying to her, what she was seeing and hearing. There is a, um, there is a DVD, a short one, a British kind of produced one that kind of a film about and then the visions come and, and you know, you kind of see more of that side of thing. There's a few, there's a few things that, that uh, show her different the different mandalas and the types and the visions that she had. So it was only when later in 44, I think she wrote to, she used to write to Bernard Servo and there was another, somebody else she wrote to, looking for kind of um, support or kind of confirmation, you know. I'm only a woman, I haven't studied, I mean, I'm a, you know, because that's how women felt about themselves. So what she could say today is, you know, I mean, look at the, gender violence in South Africa, she, she would be a cause for women. Let's face it, she'd be a cause for women, women in the church, women in society, because she ministered to women in her monastery. And she ministered to her own nuns. I mean, you know, and she left the, the main monastery, the male monastery, and she found it own. So the community grew, so she ministered to women, her own sisters. Yeah. Um, another message, well, would be the eco-message, of course. Um, 
open to all of us, to the church, you know, respect for the environment. And you see her hereditas greenness wasn't just about the plants and the animals and the, the diversity, the ecosystems. It was about um, justice, leadership, justice for women. Um, all that must be green. If it's not good, it's not green. Trust me, those images. So, um, so her theology is, yeah, so leadership. Trish, you're quiet. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if that answers that the message for the church today. Thank you. Okay. Well, I would think I would need to do a doctorate to really get into this Hildegard business. or two things quickly because time is nearly up yeah I'm, okay. I'm sorry but we had a terrible storm here oh okay i quite often i i couldn't hear what anybody was saying because the storm was so loud <clears throat> so i think I, I might have missed quite a lot one reason why uh, hildegard is regarded as feminist although they wouldn't have used that word well, when she when she and the sisters lived in Dissi Bordenberg, uh, they had a very small part of the monastery, as you said. Mm -hmm. And when she mm -hmm. said, "No, we must move away, and we must have our own convent," the monks were furious because all these women came from noble families, and their money went to the monastery. And now, when the nuns moved away to Rupertsberg, the money went to them in Rupertsberg, and the, the monks were going to lose all that money. So they were very fed up. And people uh, misinterpreted that and thought that they were just sorry that the women were leaving. But actually, it was all about money from the women's point of view. That's one thing. And another thing is, when you go, I've often been to Bingen, and when you go there, there is a whole garden of plants that Hildegard used. She learned it from Jutta. She was the one who raised uh, Hildegard. <clears throat> and she learned a lot about plants that would help people um, medicinally. And mm -hmm. as you go around the garden, there is a, a, a metal sheet next to each plant telling you what it was for and how Hildegard used it. And um, she, a lot of things that she used then could still be used today and are some of them. And then uh, there is a coffee shop uh, and, and a building where you can stay. I made a retreat there once. And they have copies of um, Hildegard's 26, they call them visions. It was something that she saw and she got that monk to paint them for her. And you showed a few of them as you were talking. And they are, they are quite incredible. They have those up and you could do a meditation on each one for a week. They are lovely. And in that coffee shop, they serve things that Hildegard would have cooked or baked. And they, those are quite nice, but they serve different kinds of coffee. And one of them is Hildegard's coffee made from acorns, which we call in German Muckafuck. And it's, it's the kind of coffee people had to use during the war when they had no coffee. It tastes too terrible for words, but the baking and the other things that Hildegard would have made were, are, are quite incredible. And her viriditas, one last word about that. Yes. When you're yes. higher up in the valley and you look down on the, the Rhine and Bingen, the green, the greenness, the viriditas of those trees and plants is beautiful. And she took it as an aspect of God, the greenness the vitality and yes. the light and the fecundity and the beauty of it. So Bingen for me was a wonderful experience and I went there quite often from Stuttgart where I lived. Thank you. Thank you Trish. Thank you.
Yes, I made those cookies of joy last year. A modern recipe, you know, that, that there's healthy, there's quite a lot of sites of um, healthy younger God is one website. Um, yeah, there's a, and then of course, um, but the Scivias Institute of Art, Dr. Nessa. Yes. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Okay. Bless you. <laughs> So yeah, thanks for your wonderful presentation and for everyone who has joined our first Mystic Matters for, for the year. And we are quite looking forward to some wonderful topics and speakers um, that will come for the rest of the year. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Eugene. Thanks, everyone. Right. Thank, Thank you very much. And God bless you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.